Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate uh, your prayer, uh, leading us in our Lord's Prayer this morning. Uh, before I jump in uh, today to our message, um, I uh, want to do something um, just to, as many of you have heard this past week, uh, you heard about uh, the shooting of Ahmad Aubrey, and uh, I just wanted to uh, remind all of us of our baptismal vows and also our Christian vows. When you become a member in the life of this church or any Methodist church, we ask you to say some vows. When you join this church, we ask you to say those vows. And when, you have your, and when you're baptized or your children are baptized, we ask you to say these vows. And so I just want to review these with you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And uh, right there, we are to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness. And, uh, and, and that's what it, part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Amen. And then the next line says, Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And again, we respond, uh, we do. And that's part of what it means to follow Jesus, is that you resist evil, and injustice, and oppression. And then the last uh, question that we ask is, Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in the union which the, which the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, please respond by saying, I do. And so I just want us as followers of Jesus to remember when we see and we experience racism, it's our job to call that out and to name it. And, uh, you know, you can't be a racist and be a Christian, uh, I don't believe. You can be a recovering racist, Amen. Uh, but you can't be a racist and be a Christian. They just don't, they just don't mesh. And so we uh, certainly want to pray for Ahmaud Aubrey. and I'm thinking about his mother today on Mother's Day and all other victims of racism. And may we as a church and may we as Woodlake Church, may we do our part and may we stand up uh, to the spiritual forces of wickedness. May we resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Amen? Amen. Now would you please pray uh, with me and for me? Most gracious and loving Lord, I ask now for your help. And Lord, I pray that um, these words I speak today are so much more than mine, but that, Lord, more importantly, they might be yours. Use me this day to speak truth as we continue this series on the prayer that you taught us, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Today, I have the privilege of speaking about one of the hardest things to do in the world, amen? And I'm very uh, uh, overwhelmed and very excited at the same time about this. We're going to be talking about forgiveness today. And so as we begin this, I want you to think about somebody in your life that you are having a hard time forgiving right now. Maybe it's one person Maybe it's several people, maybe it's nobody, I don't know. But I want you to be thinking about that person or persons. And as we go through this service today, I want you to have them in your mind. I want them to be kind of in the background as you hear my words today as we talk about forgiveness. And as we begin, I'm going to talk a little bit about debt, which sounds like even more fun, right? So we're talking about forgiveness and we're talking about debt, two of people's favorite things. And what does it mean to have a debtor? Now, the best way and probably the easiest way to, to think about a debtor is to think about uh, the, uh, this on a financial level, right? Uh, you incur a debt, somebody has to pay it off. How many of you have ever incurred a debt? If you have ever incurred a debt, wherever you are watching, I want you to raise your hand. Amen? Uh, almost everybody here, Reed has not uh, incurred any debt yet. He doesn't have his hand up, uh, and Adam doesn't either. Uh, anyway, but everybody here has incurred debt at some point in some way, right? It might be a mortgage. It might be a credit card. It might be a student loan. It might be a car payment. If you've ever incurred a debt, raise that hand. And how many of you have never found anybody that was willing to come along and pay that off? You have to pay it off yourself, Right? Because there's a very simple rule when it comes to debt. You owe, you pay. 
right? You owe, you pay. That's just the way that the system works. And if you don't believe me, you can test me in this and tomorrow call your bank institution, wherever it is that you have your debt, and say, hey, I'm tired of paying this debt. It's a burden to me. It's kind of ruining my lifestyle. I would like to, uh, to get rid of this debt and I don't want to pay it anymore. How do you think they're going to respond to that? Do you think they're going to say, okay, no problem? That's not exactly what they're going to say because people that lend money are quite touchy about this type of thing. They keep very careful accounts and you, you got to pay them back or else you might get a visit from, from some guy named Vito, right? And you don't want Vito to come visit you. Actually, there's a, a phrase for people on the street who lend money and who are determined to get it back. And it's named after an animal. It's a very uh, scary, dangerous animal. That person's called a lone shark. shark. That's right, a lone shark. Not the lone bunny, not the lone bluebird. A lone shark. Because the reason is, if you owe, you pay. That's the way it is. That's the way it works. Now, we're continuing our series on the Lord's Prayer today, and today we get to uh, a couple of phrases that Jesus uh, teaches in this prayer. And uh, this is the, the, phrase, the first part of the phrase we're looking at today. This is what it says, forgive us our debts. Now, um, depending on what kind of church you grew up in, if you grew up in the church, uh, you use different words uh, to, for debts. For example, I grew up in the Methodist church, and we always used the word trespasses. Uh, other churches, other denominations used the word debts. And so other churches, other denominations used the word sins. And they all mean the same thing. It, it doesn't really matter. But today we're going to be looking at debts because that's what Jesus, that's the word Jesus uses in the Gospel of Matthew and also in the Gospel of Luke in the Lord's Prayer. And it also fits with the story we're going to share in just a few moments. And so forgive us our debt. This means that we are to forgive God for the way that we have sinned, for the way that we have sinned against God. Because you and I have sinned against God and we have a mountain of moral debt that we cannot pay off. But you've also been sinned against. Everybody in this room, you have not just sinned, you've also been sinned against. You have some debtors. Somebody that you thought you could trust hurt you. They were jealous of you and as a result said bad things about you. They twisted the truth about you. Somebody has deliberately cheated you, taken advantage of you physically, emotionally, financially. They didn't care that they broke your heart. Somebody in your family's hurt you, and the truth is, if you live long enough, everybody in your family at some point is going to hurt you intentionally or unintentionally. A parent belittles you or neglected you or withheld affection when you needed it. A friend attacked you. We've all been victims of sin. Every single one of us. What are you going to do with the people that sin against you? What are you going to do with your debtors? How motivated are we to extend grace to our debtors, those that have sinned against us? For some of us, this is not a big deal. Forgiveness is, while it's not easy, it's not hard, and we have the ability to do it. But many people struggle more with forgiveness than just about anything else that Jesus asks us to do. We just can't extend grace. We'd much rather have vengeance, amen? Let me tell you a quick story. When the first church that I was a pastor at, um, the lead pastor had a Bible study that he taught. And uh, whenever he was going to be out of town or was going to have to miss the Bible study, there was this lady that always would be the one that would be the backup teacher. Well, uh, a new couple came to the class and, uh, and he, ex and he expressed some interest in leading the Bible study sometime. And so uh, the pastor said, okay, well, why don't you lead it this time because I'm going out of town. Well, the mistake the pastor made is that he did not tell the lady that he was, that he was getting somebody else to lead it. So when she found out about this, she was irate and she was very mad. And appropriately so, and to some degree, right? And so when the pastor found out about this, he apologized and he asked her to forgive her. He said he didn't mean to, just trying to get this new, this new couple engaged in the church. But she couldn't forgive him. And in one conversation that they had, she said, I don't forgive. 
She just didn't forgive. And so some of us are like that. We take it so personally and we just hold on to it and we can't let go. We want vengeance. So today I want to look at what Jesus says about forgiveness. And I want to look at, I want us to focus on a simple two-letter word. And that word is as. That word is as. This, um, uh, because this is what Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is huge. This is one of the most sobering words in the entire Bible. That simple two-letter word, as. You see, Jesus is making a correlation here between the way you and I treat our debtors and the way God treats us. It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So in many ways, this whole message is about that one little word, as. I'm going to look at a second scripture today, and this scripture uh, is from the Gospel of Matthew. And just to give you a little context, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, a guy named Peter, uh, he, he has a debtor. Uh, and Peter is dealing with forgiveness with somebody in the community. He wants to be able to forgive, and he wants to know what he needs to do. How many times should he forgive the person? And it might be a brother. It might be a sister. It might be one of the other disciples, right? We don't know. We just know that Peter comes up to Jesus and asks about forgiveness. And so Jesus does as he often does. When he asks a question, Jesus often either answers with another question, or as he does in this story, in this instance, he tells a story. And so this time, he tells a story. Let's take a look at it. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 uh, bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pray, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. This is a story of a king that wanted to settle accounts. And one man owed him a very, very large debt. 10,000 bags of gold is a lot of money today, amen. And it was a heck of a lot of money back then. In Jesus' day, uh, all the taxes collected in what we call the Holy Land, all the taxes that were collected in the Holy Land would have added up to 600 bags of gold. And this was 10,000 bags of gold. This is a lot of money. And what Jesus does is he takes the highest known number and he makes it plural. Kind of like a gazillion, quadrillion type number we sometimes throw out there. Like the national debt. A number that's too high to calculate. My daughter, Wesley, who actually turned 11 just a few days ago, when she was little, she used to say, I love you all the numbers. And then I would respond to her, I love you all the numbers plus one. It's just the biggest number you can think of. And so as Jesus begins to tell this story, just from those first few verses, several things would have been clear to Jesus' listeners. How could somebody come to so much wealth? That's a tremendous amount of money. Banks just don't give out that kind of money. There's just one answer to that question. The king in this story is one of staggering generosity. And he gives this money to a servant. This is a king with a generous heart. There's no other way to account for this behavior. The second thing would have been, would, that they would have noticed is what kind of person would take so much money and squander the whole thing? Because it's all gone. All 10,000 bags of gold. This is a man of unbelievable folly and selfishness to go through all this money. The third thing is that would have been picked up on is that this generous king is also the king of settled accounts. He's a king of justice. If anyone uh, understood settled accounts, it would be the author of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, who we believe was a tax collector. This is the only gospel that this story is found in, which I th find interesting. And Matthew, as a tax collector, a former tax collector, has heard all the excuses in the world, right? He knew all the excuses. 
as to why people couldn't make their payments. So the time comes for the pronouncement of judgment, and the king says, sell him, his wife, and his kids, and all they have. This is not an unusual thing in the first century. Imprisonment for debt was very common in Jesus' day. They would keep you in prison until your family friends were able to pay off debt, your debt. So it was really important to have good friends, amen? This debt, though, was so astronomically big that there was going to be no getting out of prison. Because you know what the rules of debt are, right? You owe, you pay. But then it gets interesting. Something happens in the mind of the servant. He is desperate. He's got nothing less to do, nothing left to do. So he goes for broke and he throws the Hail Mary at the end of the football game, right? As the, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And I will pay back everything. Notice the exact request here. Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. Remember the size of the debt, right? This is the national debt size debt. There is no way he's going to pay this back. It, it's, it's a joke. It's like saying you're going to empty a lake with a teaspoon. It's just not going to happen. He's begging. He's pleading with his life because he knows what's about to come. And, and all of Jesus' listeners know what to expect. They know the rule. And what's the rule again? It's this. You owe, you pay. You owe, you pay. He is the king who has settled accounts, and they're waiting for the axe to fall on this guy. But then, look what happens. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled a debt, and let him go. Wow. Wow. This is, this is simply amazing. The king does two things. First thing he does is that he releases the man, no prison, saves his family, gives him back his life. And then the second thing that's happened is, is that the debt is eliminated. The debt's eliminated. It is gone. This is a mountain of debt, a huge amount of money. And the truth is, and this is something we don't often think about debt, is that when debt goes away, somebody has to bear the brunt of that payment, right? And who takes away the debt? Who takes the burden? Who takes the hit of the debt in this story? The king does. The generous king is again generous, and he takes the hit for this debt. The king pays the debt, and what he's doing is he's offering a whole new system of debt management. You see, it used to be you owe, you pay, but now this king changes it to this. You owe, I'll pay. You owe, I'll pay. This is the economy of grace. The king says, I will pay the unpayable debt. I will take the hit. I will suffer the loss. I will take the whole price on myself so that you can go free. I'll pay. And imagine what happens when he goes home and he sees his wife, and as he knows his wife won't lose her home, and his wife won't go to jail. He sees his children, and he knows his children won't grow up and spend their entire lives in prison. They are free. They got their life back. They don't have to pay the debt back. It's all grace. Let's pause for a moment. And think about this story, because this is not just a story that Jesus tells, amen? This is a story. This is my story. Jesus says there's a king who is lavishly generous and painstakingly just. All of us have accumulated an unpayable amount of debt before him. And we add to it every time. Every time we are less than honest, every time we fudge an expense account or a tax return or cheat on a test, every time we are unloving with a five-year-old child, every time you make that cutting comment, every time you intentionally withhold something from somebody that you know needs it, every time you should have helped someone and you didn't, every time you gossip, every selfish act, we are adding to that mountain of debt. Every human is in the same boat, every single one of us. No exception. This list is me. 
But one day, a king, King Jesus, said to me, you owe, but guess what? I'll pay. You owe, but I'll pay. I'll go to the cross for you. And one day that king came to you with a mountain of moral sin, and the king said to you, you owe, I'll pay. Do you remember that day? The king said, you live in the economy of grace, and it cost him the life of his son. I remember when this happened to me. I was in between my junior and senior year of high school. It was the summer of that year. And I'd grown up in church my whole life. But it wasn't until that summer, for whatever reason, that I realized what Jesus did for me on the cross. That he took all my sin. He took all my debt. As he's done for everybody else. And he went to the cross. And he died in my place. He took my debt. He took my sin. He took my trespasses upon him. And he went to the cross. And he died. And he conquered death. And he conquered sin. And because of him, I'm free. Do you remember the day, the time, the moment where that kind of clicked for you? Where you realized what Jesus did for you? We owe everything to grace. Everything to grace. This is a great story, amen. But it's not over. It's not over. Look at verses 28 and 29. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. He demanded, pay back what you owe me. Pay back what you owe me. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Notice the words there. They're almost the exact same words that the first servant said. Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But what is also uh, that the Jesus listeners knew, what, what we need to know is that the silver in this story is, is lunch money. It's payable. It's easily payable. It's not going to take much to pay that back. But it even says that this first servant is choking the second servant. So he throws up his Hail Mary and says, be patient with me, I'll pay it back. And Jesus' listeners knew what the response would be. He knew he would do what the king did for him, right? The same thing that was done to him, he would do to the other person. <clears throat> he knew they would show grace. You see, this time there are two debtors, there are two sinners, there are two trespassers involved. And the debt is super small. They knew this man would offer grace because he had just been saved by grace. The listeners knew it. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt off. So imagine the shock that this man that had been extended amazing grace, chose not to extend grace to somebody else, right? Imagine the shock. What is clear is that the guy had no intention of giving grace. He wanted to receive grace, but he didn't want to give any grace. He was saved by the king's grace, but he would not offer it to other people. To hold grace from others is unthinkable. Where, are you, where do you fit in this story? Where do you fit in this story? Have you received God's grace yourself? And are you able to extend that grace, that mercy, that love, and that forgiveness? Or have you received it and, and you, you, for whatever reason, you just can't bring yourself to, to release it? Now we get to the third act in this story. It's different this time around. There's no tears, there's no pleading, there's no bargaining. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had the same, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? 
In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he had owed. I want us to look at verse 35 again because this is a pivotal verse. This is what it says. Read it with me. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers or sisters from your heart. Let's read that one more time because I think it's that important. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. Amen. (laughs) That's some sobering words there. We got some debtors. Will you choose grace? Will you choose grace? Will you choose to forgive? Let me just say a quick few words about forgiveness or what it is not, perhaps. Forgiveness does not does not mean to excuse or to tolerate wrongdoing. It doesn't mean doing what the other person wants you to do. It doesn't mean putting up with that which does not need to be put up with. Some of us have experienced very deep wounds. You were abused. You were maybe betrayed. Forgiving doesn't mean allowing that behavior to go unconfronted. Please know that. If someone sins against you and refuses to acknowledge the truth and to repent, you may not be able to reconcile. You you can't build on a relationship unless there is mutual shared understanding of the truth and repentance where it is appropriate. Forgiving them doesn't mean everything's back to being perfect and honky-dory. Forgiving them means you give up the right to hurt them back. Notice in the story that the first servant started to choke the second servant. Forgiveness means that you begin to wish them well before God. And you can do that. It might take a long time and a lot of help. But it's the only way. The way that I read the Lord's Prayer and the way I see that word as, forgiveness is not really optional. It's what we have to do as followers of Jesus. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I think I've said this before when I speak about forgiveness. You might not be at a place to forgive, but you begin that conversation and say, God, I don't want to forgive so-and-so. But Lord, I ask that you begin to change my heart so that I would want to forgive so-and-so. And you take that step. You pray that prayer. You pray this Lord's Prayer every day. You, rem- you bring up that person. And hopefully after a certain amount of time, you might be able to begin to forgive that person. It's not easy. It's a process. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. That is where we find freedom. As long as we're holding on, as long as we're clutching, we will not be truly free. It's only when we can finally forgive and let go that we can find freedom. Walter Wink is a uh, uh, a theologian, and he writes about a couple that were called that were named the Doshmeyers, and they were kind of on a peacemaking mission, visiting some Polish Christians a few years after World War II. And they were emissaries of another group. And they asked these Polish Christians if they would be willing to meet with some Christians from West Germany. The West German Christians wanted to ask forgiveness for what had taken place during World War II and begin a new relationship with them. And so these people were hoping to try to bridge that relationship. And so they were shared this information, and the Polish Christians heard this, and afterwards there was a long silence. And then finally, one of the Polish Christians said, what you ask is impossible. Every stone in Warsaw is soaked with their blood and our blood. What they ask is impossible. We cannot forgive. And the Doshmeyers understood the emotion of that moment. 
And so they, they understood that, and they, they understood all that went on during World War II. And as they were getting ready to leave, they decided to pray, and so they prayed, and at the end of the prayer, like many people do when they have a prayer time, they decided to close by praying the Lord's Prayer, which Christians have done through every country and every century for almost 2,000 years. They were being servants of the King. They prayed the Lord's Prayer until they got to the words we've been talking about today. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then they stopped in their tracks and there was dead silence. And then the Polish Christian who had spoken up earlier said, I must say yes, because if I don't forgive, I can no longer say this prayer. I can no longer call myself a Christian if I don't forgive. Humanly speaking, he said, I can't do it. But God will give me the strength. And 18 months later, Polish Christians and West German Christians met in Vienna and established a friendship and a relationship that lasts till this day. And I wonder if over the last 2,000 years, how many marriages might have been changed, how many friendships might have changed if when the Lord's Prayer was prayed and, we, and when, as we prayed it, we stopped at that part where it said, forgive us our debtors. If we actually stopped and we forgave and we let the Holy Spirit work. And so what we're going to do now is as we close the service, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, and it's going to be on the screen. And what I want to invite you to do is I want us to pause, and there are going to be a couple of pauses. We're going to pray at the beginning of the prayer, and then we're going to get to the part, forgive us our debts. And we're going to pause, and we are going to con silently confess our sins to God. If you want to confess your sins out loud, you're welcome to do that. Just be careful who's around you, amen? But confess your sins to God. And then we'll un hit the unpause button and we'll pray as we forgive our debtors and then we'll pause again. And we're going to use that time to begin forgiving the people that we have not yet forgiven in our lives. And again, you might not be ready to forgive today, but begin that prayer. Say, Lord, I don't want to forgive. Help me to want to forgive. And then we'll conclude the prayer together. So I invite you, as people have done for thousands of years, to pray this prayer with me. And for the purposes of this sermon, we're going to use the word debt and debtor rather than trespasses. And again, it will be up on the screen. So let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Lord, we now silently confess our sins for you and seek the forgiveness that you, we know that you will offer us. Let us confess. Let us continue the Lord's Prayer. As we forgive our debtors, let us again pause and let us silently begin to forgive those people that we, for whatever reason, just can't forgive. And may we believe and may we trust that the Holy Spirit will come and will intercede for us and will help us. Let us forgive. Let us finish the Lord's Prayer together. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My hope and my prayer for you this week, and I hope you'll take this as your next step, is that you'll work on forgiving other people. 
Sometimes we think we maybe have forgiven people and we realize maybe when we see them or we hear about them, we haven't. May we begin to take that step. And may we know that just as Jesus has forgiven us, we are called to forgive others. And that may we remember that simple two-letter word, as. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. May we forgive our debtors. And may we do as Jesus calls us to do. Amen. Amen.